Welcome back to the town of Alcanis then for uh, round four of the FIM CEV Repsol Championship at Motorland Aragon. We just missed an incredibly dramatic, if you didn't see it, Moto3 Junior World Championship race. We have one race left for you today, and that is the Moto2 European Championship race. Earlier on, we saw Edgar Pons completely dominant in race one, as he has been in the last couple of races in the championship, and extend his championship lead uh, to finish, go on from his win in Barcelona his, and his second place and win in the first round in Portimao. We have had four races of the Moto2 Europe. European Championship so far and uh, well it was an exciting race in race one Harry but no one could really catch Pons could they? No but you know you say Pons was away at the, at the front but he didn't have an easy time but when I spoke to him in Parc Femme after he was complaining that he wasn't able to break in a straight line or break how he wanted to and there was a lot of movement in his bike so clearly he and the team are going to make some changes to try and solve those problems but with the temperatures rising between race one and race two now that could, you know, those changes are still a bit unknown and who knows what will happen in this race as he and the team try and fix those problems. You know, maybe they fix those problems and he goes on to win by 10 seconds or maybe... They could take a step backwards and set up. You see it happens exactly. so often. And as you say, look, the temperature's here now approaching 40 degrees, I think, outside. It is absolutely scorching. Track temperatures will be probably over 50 degrees. You can see the sunshine baking this Motorland Aragon track, which hosts the most GP World Championship, the World Superbike Championships, and the FIM CEV Repsol. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned earlier, we've seen races today from the Moto3 Junior World Championship and the Superbike European Championship already. This is on race two from the Moto2 European Championship. And just to remind you, there are two qualifying sessions yesterday. The best time... Uh, from either of those sessions decides their grid position for both the races so despite the results from race one the grid positions uh, remain the same and as we've talked about so often but just the technical regulations and tire manufacturers are the same as the Moto2 World Championship so they're on Dunlops the idea being that there's uh, less of a step up and we do have one super stock runner with us which is Santana on the Yamaha R6 everyone else on a Moto2 bike yeah exactly and with this change in technical regulations as you're saying it has brought it much closer to the World Championship and in previous years we have seen winners of this series struggle a bit you know switching to the different sized tyres and the different make of tyres that the World Championship previously had but now now this is really the feeder class once again you know there's no other moto 2 series that even comes close to rivaling the level of riders in this European Championship. No, totally. That have gone through to most GP, as we say, 70% of all the most GP field have come through the CV Repsol. And I think you've hit it on the head there, Harry. So many people really don't realise how important the tyres are. And when you talk about the tyre change, we're going to about to see it most GP this year, obviously, they're going to change manufacturers' tyres. I think, you know, it's a completely different riding style on a different tyre. We saw in the Superbike European Championship, the riders were, we chatted about as well, the fact that the tyres this year were very different from the Michelins they were using last year. And that's affected the complete setups of the bike. Riders, uh, their style doesn't work on certain machines or certain tracks it's a huge huge part isn't it exactly it's like anything you know you spend so much time learning how to do things one way and then someone comes in and says oh well now you have to do it this way so it takes a lot of time to readjust and unfortunately you know for guys like Jesco Raffin who was the champion of this series last year you know he's struggling to score the points and sponsors and teams are going to say well you know you've had a half season to try and adapt and nothing's really happened it is very cutthroat so with this change in ties it is going to be huge yeah. The riders. And as you said, I think it, the whole point of the change the, this year, the FIMC of Europe, so was incorporated by becoming Moto 2 European Championship, Superbike European Championship and Moto 3 Junior World Championship is to try and prevent there having to be that many steps. As we see in Moto 3 and Moto 2, same rubber, same bikes. So that means that the riders just have to maybe learn a few new tracks on the World Championship calendar and it will hopefully make the progression up for them. And it's great to see that progression for a young rider through the championship. Start off in Moto3, make your mark in the CEV, Moto3 Junior World Championship, and then make your move up to the World Championship. If you're impressed there, like these young guys here, Edgar Pons, already rumoured to be moving up to the Moto2 World Championship next year. Yep, and as you say, Edgar Pons, they're very late to leave the pits, and probably the last person out of pit lane. You know, maybe he has on some different tyres to everyone else that he doesn't want everyone to see yet, or maybe he's going to, you know, really push on this lap to see if his braking problems have been solved because despite there being the gap between race one and race two, there's no chance for them to test anything on track. It's all theoretical changes. Yeah, and that is exactly what you're saying. It's Everyone knows this. It's science on a motorbike setup. It's so easy to make a backward step. It's not always common sense. There's so many things, that variables that affect each other that he might have said to his mechanics, well, I want you to try something. And as you say, you get out there on track and work out that it actually doesn't work. Yep, and there is Alex Renz, who rides for the Pagginess Amores HP40 team in the World Championship, here to lend some support to, to the guys in the junior team. Renz is also developing his own Moto3 team in this championship. They ran it last time out in Barcelona and had a, had a pretty good debut.
Yeah, and as we said, we've talked about the bikes being similar. Obviously, a lot of the teams in the Moto3 Junior World Championship you've just seen and the Moto2 European Championship are similar. We have the Paginus Amaryllis HB40 Junior team here and the Paginus Amaryllis HB40 team in the Moto2 World Championship. You've got the Honda Team Asia bikes. We've got the AGR team. Uh, you know, so there is a real crossover. And as you say, these, these teams using this championship, not only to develop the bikes and bring the riders through, but uh, Rins, who came through this championship himself, coming down to uh, lend a bit of support. Exactly. So this is a really good proving ground for riders to make themselves known. And it's also a great place for riders who have had a bit of a tough time in the World Championship to come back, you know, prove that they do still have it and regain their confidence. Lots of the guys, especially in this Moto2 class, have had World Championship experience, be it in Moto3 or Moto2. And, you know, they're coming back to the European Championship to, re to rebuild, reassess and try and go again to the World Championship, maybe with a slightly better package underneath them. Yeah, and as you say, what a brilliant place to come and regain confidence. You're riding on some incredible World Championship tracks that have been used. All, you know, when we look at it, we've got Hareth, as we say. We've got uh, Aragon, we've got Catalonia. These are all Championship tracks that they will get to ride on. Yep, and there is Pablo Nieto, who helps to manage the Sky VR46 racing team in Moto3 in the World Championship. He obviously works for the VR46 brand and is there helping Luca Marini, who is Valentino Rossi, Rossi's half-brother. So clearly it's a very uh, 46, affair, 46 affair on this Moto2 grid as Pablo's there. He's been in that pit garage almost all weekend. I've seen him, you know, having little chats to Marini and helping him with one or two things. And then when Moto3's out, I've also seen him there lending a word or two to, to Balega. Balega. Yeah, I mean, it must be awesome as a young rider because, let's be honest, motor racing, there's so many things that you learn from experience uh, that you can only learn from experience. To have people like that giving you advice, just helping you through it. And as you say, it's not just a case of bigging up these riders and getting them a ride. It's about developing them, their whole personalities, their careers, their riding styles, their professionalism from a young age. And, you know, we, we're joking about Messi early, obviously looking about kind of, you know, 11 years old, he's 14. These guys have been racing for, for a number of years already. You have to start so young if you want to make it to the top, don't you? Yeah, certainly. And with guys like Pablo Nieto, not only do they help with they also help with confidence you know lots of people say there's a second between the years on a lot of these riders so confidence is a huge thing and here we see Edgar Pons talking to his dad Cito Pons team boss lining up on pole again he had a really strong race in race one pretty dominant never really looked challenged the only time he's been beaten was the uh, race the second race in Portimao when Javi Vieje uh, took the race win otherwise he has looked just unbeatable this season and as you say only going ahead and winning, not like by one mere standards of kind of 11, 12 seconds as we saw in the Moto3 race, more like four or five seconds, but controlling that lead and looking just very commanding, isn't he? Yeah, and he seems to be able to produce lap times that are about half a second quicker than other guys from a, from a you know, out of a hat sort of. So there's Javi Vieje on the team Targo Bank Motorsport Tech 3 bike. He, as you can see, has had a pretty good season as well. Second place, that win we were just talking about at Portimao, missed out in the Catalonia race, and then third in race one here at Motorland Aragon. And yeah. he'll be looking again for another good performance, another podium, really. Yeah, hopefully he, he and the team have made one or two changes to that bike because he didn't really look like he was able to challenge Edgar Pons at all in the first race. He, you know, he had a tricky enough time competing with Stephen Odendahl, who we'll get to in a second, as those two fought for the podium. Yeah, and that is the second of the Paginus Amaryllis HB40 Junior team bikes. We were just chatting about him, obviously getting advice from Yeto. That is um, Luca Marini, 17-year-old, half-brother of a certain Valentino Rossi, and he knows a thing or two about winning races. And not a bad start for him, fifth, fourth, and a second place in Catalonia, unfortunately, crashed out the uh, race one. Yeah, and he limped away a bit, so, you know, who, who knows how his foot slash ankle will handle throughout the race um, distance. But he is on the grid and he does look pretty happy. So hopefully he'll be ready to go. You know, got some ice on that in the two hour break and uh, is uh, ready for another crack at the whip. And great to see some of the fans enjoying the free hospitality. As I say, the whole thing, this FIMCV Repsol Championship is free. So if you fancy coming out to any of the rounds, 6th September in Albacete, 4th of October in Navarra, 1st November in Jerez, 15th of November in Valencia. Find a place to stay and come along to the track for free. You can get pit walks, absolutely everything. It's a really nice, friendly paddock, isn't it, Harry? Yep. And here is a rider who had an excellent ride in race one, Eric Granado. He had a bit of a tough start to it a bit of a tough mid race but towards the end he really put in some really impressive laps faster than that of Pons at that stage so I reckon Granado could be one to watch for maybe fighting for third on that podium. No worries and there is Stephen Odendahl who you mentioned the South African rider for the AGR team on the Calyx now brilliant ride from him to take second place in race one disappointing that he uh, didn't finish the second race in Portimao after finishing the podium and in Catalonia finished fourth but uh, yeah he looked, it looked like a bit more determined you mentioned the 100% on his cap he's pointing to it again Harry. Yep ready to give a 100% yet again, his motivational hat. Hopefully it brings him as much good luck as it did in the first race. Ondal obviously right up there, dicing with Vieja for the podium.
Okay, and up next we have uh, the Frenchman, Alan Tesher. Now, as we know, Tesher was a little bit sore, wasn't he, um, from uh, from a crash you were saying yesterday, and uh, unfortunately for him, you know, couldn't quite perform at the level that he was kind of used to in the race. Well, that's Fellini, so maybe Tesher has not taken his place on the grid. No, Fellini's in uh, in seventh, so uh, we're still unsure if uh, Tesher's there. But Fellini had a really strong race in ra strong race in race one. Um, he came really good at the end and was setting incredible lap times, about half a second faster than those of Tesher. So I reckon if Fellini can get a good start after his pretty disastrous start in race one, he'll be right up there for the podium as well. I kind of pegged him as my dark horse in race one, which at the start didn't seem like my smartest idea, but uh, he went all good in the end. No, you pegged him as dark horse. He came fourth. It's not bad. Tetsuka Nakashima there on the Teleri. TSR Calix, as you say, raced in Moto2 uh, as well, Cobb with the Team JR, then started season but failed to finish. Bad crash at Silverson last year, so rediscovering some confidence here. And while those one results will give him that confidence, 7, 6, 5th and 6th in race 1 here at Motoland Aragon. So, uh, you know, exactly job done, really, I suppose, getting your confidence back on the bike. Yeah, and really consistent results, which is, you know, one of the big things. Sure, he hasn't been right there in the podium fight just yet, but... It, all it takes is, you know, one or two races, a track that really suits you, and then you'll be right up there. And here we come to number 55, Alejandro Medina, on the Ariane bike, a pretty unique bike by Moto2 standards, not really the uh, Calyx or Suter that we see in the World Championship, but uh, he had a strong race in race one as well. Yeah, and the 18-year-old from Spain on the Team Stratos, you mentioned Ariane. As we said, classic example of someone that's come through the CEV Moto3 Championship, came fifth in 2013, first season in Moto2 last year, had a big uh, crash, injured him earlier on, but improved late on in the season, and already this year, he's had point scoring finish in every race, so uh, I think he should be really, really happy. Yeah, certainly. And that, and that is what you see in this class. Is a lot of riders have improved dramatically over their performances last year. So clearly the switch to the Dunlop tyres and to the standardised uh, wheel size as the World Championship is suiting a lot of riders. So maybe teams will now start looking to this Moto2 field a lot more. So just to confirm, we didn't get a shot of him on the grid, but Alan Tesho is lined up there at the back yep, of the Alan second row. So he is ready to race. in sixth place. So that's good. So I know we were, we know he was a bit battered and bruised, we say, from yesterday, but uh, that won't stop him. So let's have a look at this official starting grid for the FIM. See reps for Moto2 European Championship uh, race. 5.11 after this, we will be past the half point, halfway point. Pons on pole, Vierhe and Marini complete the front row with Granado, Stephen Odendal, and Alan Tesher, as we say, confirming there that he will be starting from the back of the second row. Yep, then Fellini in seventh, starting the third row ahead of Nagashima and Medina. Now, it'll be interesting to see if, you say, Fellini can get a better start. I think he will definitely be able to mix it with the guys at the front because some of those times he's putting in were brilliant. But row four is Ruhu, um, Ramdan Rosli, Thibal Burton, uh, Max Scheib on row five, Zavi, sorry, Javi Cardellas and Thomas Gradinger completing the fifth row. Yep, ahead of Marco Nekvasil ahead of Nicky Coates and Adrian Pettet rounding out row six, the Swiss rider. A huge mix of nationalities, as we keep saying. And then Miquel Pons, no relation to Edgar, ahead of Max Edeline and Andreas Gonzalez, who had quite a nasty crash at turn one in race one. He did. Julian Morales, Mark Buckner and Corey Turner make up row eight. And Thomas Sigvarts and Stefan Frossard. And I miss the other Swedish rider there because there's so many Swedish riders. Sogel, uh, Raimi and Santana completing the grid. Just to touch on Nicky Coates, uh, qualified in 17th. You see, I think pretty much finished uh, across the line in 17th in race one. British rider, uh, a lot of potential. Featured in the 125 World Championships back in 2007. Had injuries really kind of holding back the last couple of seasons. So 26 years of age now, he'll be looking to try and kick his career back on and that's actually exactly what he said he wants to do you know he wants to kind of uh, use this CEV uh, Moto2 European Championship to re-establish himself on the world scene yeah and as we saw there all the riders filtering through that tight left hand at turn one 90 degrees and we saw some drama there as we said with Gonzalez in the first race and riders will be looking to avoid that again because you know you have some guys further further back in the field who are trying to make a bit of a name for themselves and will leave it perhaps a bit too late on the brakes. So some of those top guys will have to be wary. We saw last year that in the Superbike race, Carmelo Morales got taken out. And it would be a real shame if someone like Marini or like Pons had that happen to them in this race. And I think that, if anything, there's more emphasis in, in Moto3, and Moto3, say, for instance, in the Superbike, so there, because their bikes are so similar, they're desperate to get an advantage, you know, off the line to make up as many places as they can. And there's just only a certain amount of track space to get through turn one. And as you said, there are lots of lines you can take through there that will allow you to come through to turn two. But uh, hopefully, Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see no contact this time. Yeah, certainly in Moto3 just previously, we saw uh, definitely some aggressive moves from one or two riders, pushing some right on to the rumble strips out wide. That Team Talisor book does look really nice, doesn't it? It's got to be said. There's something about the just a plain red colour I like on it. The uh, Tetsuka Nagashima there. 
Uh, some lovely liveries in Moto2, actually. Same with the Petronas Race Line Malaysia bike. I like the turquoise. Yep, certainly. Nagashima's bike does remind me a lot of the uh, old TSR 500 bike that went on to some success. And you also see that TSR livery out at the Suzuka 8 Hour, which will be coming up in just a couple of weeks' time. A lot of riders from the World Championship obviously do go over to Suzuka. Yeah, it's uh, Paula Spargo and Bradley Smith from the uh, Monster Yamaha Tech 3 team will be there. Uh, Suzuka, an incredible chance for manufacturers to show off their superbikes, obviously, uh, because it'll be the first time I think Smith's ridden the new R1 as well, and the same with Paula Spargo. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that will be exciting as always. But just a quick one, then. I know it's, it's almost impossible for you to say because of the weather conditions of the change. I'm going to put in a spot, though, Harry. Is anyone going to stop Pons? No, I think that Pons, Pons will have it. You know, his team is hugely experienced in both this championship and at the world championship level. And I I think they'll be able to draw on that experience to make the one or two changes that they needed and even with those problems that Pons had you know he seemed really unhappy with them but uh, he still seemed pretty much untouchable in race one. Yeah, it's not bad when you've won by like five seconds to come in and uh, three and a half seconds and go, oh, yeah, I wasn't very happy with the setup of the bike. So it's, 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 hard, it's easier to moan when you're at the back, I suppose. But, uh, but yeah, uh, congratulations to him from that race one victory. It will be incredibly interesting to see if anyone can keep with him as the riders line up for this. The Moto2 European Championship race two. Final bit of action we're bringing you from Motorland Aragon today. We've had uh, almost five hours of racing, five races to get through. It's gone so quickly. And uh, as you can see, there, let's just recap the grid really quickly. Edgar Bond starting from pole. Javi Vieje. Montago Bank Motorsport in second. Luca Marini, Ponza's teammate, completes the front row. Granado, Odendal and Tesha on the second row. Fellini, Nagashima and Medina complete the third row. And we should have the lights come on. And just to remind you, they'll all come on for a period between one and three seconds. When they go out, we are underway on the final race of today. So the lights go on. Pons looking in poised. And a great start again from Pons as the lights go out. He is off to an absolute flyer. Number... 83 is actually having a terrible wheelie at the bit, start there. Of, yeah, a bit of a disaster there from Eric Granado, but again, Pons leads beautifully through turn one. And Vieje second, Odendal already up into third once again. Brilliant start from the South African, although Vieje this time managing to get over him, but look at Pons disappearing into the distance once more. Yeah, it looks like another almost repeat of race one. It's still very early stages, but, you know, when you're able to make those few bike lanes at the start those can just expand out exponentially and can be a huge advantage obviously uh, the advantage is going first through turn one do you know what I mean you don't have to worry about picking your way through and being tiptoeing like a lot of the other riders have to so he's taking advantage of that hugely to open up a three tenth gap already in just the first sector Another bad start, though, from Marini, who has dropped way down the order to seventh, despite starting on that front row. Maybe the start through is one weakness. I did notice that he flicks his leg back a lot like a Moto3 start, and it looks like he's been swallowed up by Tesha there as well. However, another Italian who's made a good start is Fellini. Fellini is up into fourth and is already starting to hassle Odendal. So this could be Fellini's real time to shine. What did you say? If he could get a good start, then young Italian, he, he was going to be challenging for that podium. And I tell you what, he's got a great start. You know, we talk about Pons breaking away. It's not, not as evident as we first thought. He's having a look back there as well. These four have already got a bit of a gap to the rest of the field. Yeah, now Vieja seems to be within striking distance. It'll be interesting to see what happens at the end of the straight. We certainly saw Odendal much stronger than Vieja on that tech three towards the end of the straight so it'll be interesting to see if Vieja with that slipstream from Pons can try and gain on him and Nagashima on the TSR up into fifth so uh, it'll be interesting to see if he can close down on Fellini but here we go straight away it looks like Odendal is having a look at Vieja look at that track temperatures we said they get up to 50 degrees that is confirmation for you completely unknown as to how these tyres are going to react really at those kind of pressures and it looks like Odendal had gotten through on Vieja at the end of the straight, as we saw, but Vieja had lined up a beautiful move into those final two corners. Nagashima getting the back out there, losing almost the line completely. That was incredible to see the rubber, you know, leaving black marks down like that on the track already. But uh, there is Pons into turn one, and Odendal just having trouble getting it stopped, almost going to the back of Vieja there. Yeah, under a half second lead for Pons at this early stage, so he hasn't been able to break away quite as much as in race one, but, you know, he, Vieja needs to be careful. He can't get too caught up in this fight with Odendal, or else it'll be game over and there's Marini just on the back of uh, Medina Tesha as well has taken just overtaken Medina in fact to go into sixth place Marini and Medina just behind him in seventh and eighth so there we go a really good start for Medina actually a much stronger showing in this first part of the race than in race one yeah, it's a great thing about having two races in a day, isn't it? You can learn from your mistakes, as you mentioned earlier, and you can really, you know, make sure that you don't make them again. And also, change, little changes in the setup can make a huge difference on the rider's confidence on the bike. So, the front three then of Pons, Viege, and Odendal, with Fellini just another half second back. Vieja definitely with Pons now, and I reckon that Odendal will just sit behind Vieja and try and get involved in this battle for the lead. 
because with the slipstream, the airhead will be able to close down rapidly. And we have seen Odendal be so strong, you know, whether it's the line he takes or the setup of his bike that does allow. Again, we see Pons. A lot of wobbling as he tries to break, so maybe those problems from race one not fully gone. Do you know what? That that looks scary actually trying to get that stop because that, that kind of wobble, that's not him riding at his normal on the edge style. That is genuinely not been able to get that bike stopped. So heavy braking zones at the end of the straights, he could really struggle here. Yeah, it also seemed like that flip through that, that those corners there wasn't quite as smooth as it had been in previous races. So maybe there have been one or two tweaks to suspension and things like that that haven't quite worked out. Watch Odendahl there, pulling out the strip sheen on Vieje to uh, take second place, and then Vieje just comes straight back under brakes, does he? No, Odendahl makes that stick into the final corner as they come around onto the straight. Yeah, and it'll be, oh, but Odendahl now runs it wide, and Vieje's able to cut back up yep, the inside. Yeah, come past us here on the comfort screen, across the start, finish line, it's Pons, Vieje, Odendahl, and Fellini there, putting in a really rapid time. Yeah, Pons able to extend his lead to over 0.6 of a second, as Fellini is now right there with Odendahl. Fellini's going to start hassling Odendahl for this race, and, hope, and it looks like Odendahl's actually dropped back a bit on Vieje. Clearly, Vieje is really strong through that last corner and this first corner. Yeah, I think Vieje's got the intention a bit between his teeth to not let Pons try and get away at the front because he knows if he does that uh, he controls the race so well but Fellini as you say closing up on Odendahl bit of a gap now back to Nagashima over two seconds yeah also with Vieja he knows that he can't let Pons get too far away because Vieja is the only other rider who's really close to Pons in the championship Vieja able to take a first and a second when they went to Portimao but failing to finish in Barcelona and here's a replay of the move by Vieja can't get past through turn 16, but then he's getting ready for turn Look at 17. That. So much tighter, as you say. Clips the Apex Era 17 while Odendahl ran wide and was forced to run even wider. But uh, Pons here just starting to eke out. It's over half a second now, I reckon, that gap over Vieja in second place. But the lap times between the top three are all pretty close, all in the low 155s. So there's still all to play for, and it'll be interesting to see if Vieja is just biding his time. You know, under half a second, that's pretty close, but it does unfortunately look like Fellini in fourth has now dropped off this leading trio. Yeah, they're just starting to space out a little bit here. Now, that's as they're settling into their rhythm, they're settling into a groove, finding their lines, you know, what's working, but also, as we know, we've we seen in, in race one and, and super races, tyres will play a huge uh, part in this race. So um, it could be very interesting towards the end. Don't think just because they're spreading apart now, we won't be getting the frantic over taking action maybe not quite like we had in the moto 3 race but we should be getting some later on and odendahl just uh setting into third position now a little bit disappointed i think they'll be dropping back so much from uh, from viage and it'll be interesting to see if viage can close down on ponds we have seen viage really strong in this last corner and it, and on the brakes into turn one it looks like ponds pretty steady on the brakes there all the riders seem to like to step the back end out just a tiny bit as they come into turn one yeah Fellini there just showing exactly how much he likes to get the back out and Nagashima how's that gap from Fellini to Nagashima it's just under three seconds now so 2.669 as you can see there definitely just starting to spread out a little bit but Pons his gap at the front staying pretty consistent you know he's uh, he's not managing to pull away too much from Viege which I think is fascinating because yeah look Viege it seems to almost be closing on him now yeah definitely the gaps the gaps visibly closed by 0.2 just in that first sector Pons setting a 32.7 whereas Viege was able to set a 32.5 Viege also set the fastest lap of the race so far on that last lap with a 155 dead so he's showing he's got the pace then to take the fight to Edgar Pons. So we could be getting a little bit of a scrap here for first position, which is we'd like to see. Confirmation now of the fastest lap you just mentioned as they've completed lap 3-3. Let's just do a rundown of the top 10. Then it is Pons, Viege and Odendahl to top 3. Fellini in 4th, Nagashima 5th, Marini 6th, Tesha 7th, Granado in 8th, Medina 9th and Rossley in 10th. Yeah, really good showing from a lot of those guys. Granado not had the best start for the race. As we said, he bogged it off the line a bit. But we saw in race one that he can come strong at the end, so hopefully they haven't changed too much of that setup. And it can be a repeat performance as Vierge tries to close in on Pons. It looks like the gap stayed about the same as they make their way onto the back straight. Yeah, it's gone down to three tenths now. So, you know, he definitely had it opened up to half a second. So I think that he's not going to have it all his own way in this race as much as he did. We'll have to see how it goes on. But look at that battle then for fifth place, led by Nakashima. He's got Marini, Tesha and Granado, Medina in there, Rossley and Ruhu, all the way back from uh, fifth to 11th, separated by just two seconds. One gap that has closed is Odendahl to Vierge. Odendahl now right up with Vierge as they continue to both be within one second of Pons. The gap is about double from uh, Odendahl to Vierge as it is to Yeah, Pons Odendahl just set the fastest lap that time around on lap four, 154.809. So you're right, the South African definitely responding. Yeah, and that lap 
from Odendal is getting close to the, the, the sort of pace that we see in the World Championship from the Moto2 riders. Last year, Thomas Luti set a 154.25 during the race, and Odendal there has just put in a 154.8. So he's getting there slowly. And Fellini has got onto the back of this group. Sorry, apologies. I'm going mad. He hasn't. He's a drop. I was insane. But look at Odendal, man. He's gone to the back of Vies. Unbelievably. Look at that. He's really closed the gap now. And I think he's going to need to find a way through if he wants to uh, challenge for the race win. Odendal has a very interesting style when he brakes. He always seems to tilt his head to the left whenever he's hard on the brakes. Just something I've noticed there. That's an interesting spot, actually. But uh, he's still looking for the inside. But I reckon, you know, as we said, we've seen Odendal so strong at the back half of the race. Oh, the back half of the straight, sorry. And I reckon he'll wait there to again try and get past the edge. But the big thing is, is can Odendal keep up this pace of high 154s and therefore be able to get two ponds at the front? You know, last lap, Odendal was half a second part faster than ponds. So if he can get past the edge, I reckon we could be in for a pretty good race as that gap seems to again be closing down. Yeah, he needs oh, to get past. big slide there from Pons as he got on the gas. The rear end just stepping out a tiny bit. Yeah, Pons definitely not having the pace, you know, advantage he had in race one. And it looks like it is going to be these three battling out for the race winners. Fellini is dropping back consistently now. Two and a half seconds back off the back of Odendal. And then there's another four and a half seconds back to Nagashima in fifth. But as you say, brilliant battle in fifth place between Nagashima all the way down to Ruhu in 11th. Yeah, pretty close battle there for that as Odendal looks up the inside, but no, Vierge just closes the door on him. Cadden Odendal get it lined up for turn 17. He's closing, but I don't think he'll be able to get past there. Just couldn't get his bike stopped though, could the AGR team bike there? Just hard on the brakes, but again, coming on the straight, has he got the power to blast past Vierge? Not quite. No, just seems to not be able to close it down. And again, I think he'll have to wait for the straight. But, you know, will Vierge take these more defensive lines, which will slow down the pair and allow Pons to escape at the front more as Pons now extends his lead to over half a second. There's not much in it in lap times, but Pons was about 0.1 faster than the pair behind that last lap. It's going to be close, isn't it? I think as you say, oh, but that is Vierge running wide, is it? Or is he just taking a bit of a random line for there? It looks like he's going to try and block Odendal up the inside. Yep, beautiful. Yeah, brilliant use of racing line there. As you say, look like he'd run wide, but just taking a different one to, uh, I think, keep Odendal on his toes and stop him making the move at the inside. He knows that Odendal's got the pace in him. Odendal, in the same respect, knows he's got to get past Vierge if he wants to have any chance of catching Pons. He's just eked out a 0.8 of a second lead at the, start, the, at the head of the, this group. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's going to become harder and harder to close down because he's not going to slow down too much. No, nah, certainly. And as these two battle, you know, it'll slow them down and allow Pons to escape. Will Fellini be able to catch them? Almost certainly not. You know, three seconds down. An unfortunate uh, performance from Fellini, but, you know, he's still up in fourth, which would be another strong result from the Italian. A yellow flag has just come out at turn seven, unfortunately. We'll see if we can get uh, some pictures on that in a second. But, yeah, you're right. Odendal, Viege. And Pons, the reverse order of, uh, of these front three. Here we go, right out 52, crashed at turn seven, but he's okay. It's Corey Turner, the Australian. Yep, unfortunate end for him. It does seem like Vierge is really strong from turn 10 to turn 15 as they get onto the straight. He seems to be able to create quite the big gap to Odendal there. But then down the straight, Odendal seems to be just be able to close it up a tiny, tiny bit. But again, I don't think Odendal will be close enough to make a pass. Yeah, we saw that in race one, didn't we? And Viage was closing when Odendal was ahead, incredibly through the twisty bits before they came onto the back straight. But then Odendal just seemed to have the power to blast away from him. But uh, Pons now, his lead at the front. Yeah, it's extending. It's almost a second. It's nine tenths. Yep, there's his pit crew showing him the board to tell him just how far ahead he is. And uh, it looks like he'll be able to just keep pushing this because he's now 0.2 faster than Viage as Oendal drops to a 159, which is really disappointing from the South African. I think he's uh, either he's taking too much of his tires or he's just, he's just struggling to get past Viage and it's just slowing him up, if you know what I mean. He's having to adapt his lines to look for the overtake. Mm. It just means he's not having the optimum uh, time around the, the lap. But, uh, but yeah, Pons, again, just looks comfortable, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's still only these top three that are still able to run into the 155s. The rest of the field are on 156s or 157s. Uh, it looks like Ruhu is setting 156s, which is faster than both Tesha and Nagashima ahead of him. As we say that, Alan Tesha gets ahead of Nagashima, Tesha up to 7th. Brilliant work there, and as you say, Tesha ahead of him. Actually, Granado putting in 156.6s again, putting in some good pace. Granado and Marini getting involved in a decent scrap too. Uh, so uh, scraps all throughout the field, but we are checking out this battle for the race win with Edgar Pons leading, and he's eked it out. Well, they're keeping it at just under nine tenths there, so they have actually closed it by a couple of tenths that last level. One tenth. 
Yeah, they're, they're keeping him honest, certainly. And, you know, we saw in race one that Edgar Pond seemed to be managing the gap a bit. Obviously, in race one, the gap was a fair bit bigger. But maybe now we see, we're see we seeing Pons keep that gap at about a second, yeah. not wanting to push too much, because he does seem to not fully be comfortable on that bike. Maybe you're right. I think this might be a very a case of a sensible learning from race one, as where he maybe pushed a little bit too far, burnt for the tyres, and was, as you say, worried and not very happy at the end. And just there, we saw Pons look back as a yellow flag unfortunately comes out at turn 12. Again, more information when we get it. But Ondal looks to have a look up the inside of Vierge as uh, Marini closes down on Granado. Marini breaks out of the slipstream. Has he done it too early? No, it looks like Marini's done it at almost no. the perfect time. Granado keeps the line into turn one, and that is Rider 56 crashed Thomas, turn 12. Thomas, Gr Thomas Gradinger, the Austrian rider, unfortunately crashing out, but he is okay as Marini settles in behind Granado as the pair charge past our commentary position just on the start-finish line. And Granado really running at a pace that I don't know if enough time to catch Fellini, but he's, uh, he's looking impressive there, isn't he, in fifth? Yeah, it seems to just be these first, you know, three or four laps that Granado's struggling with a bit, and if you could sort those out, I reckon the kid would be really dangerous. Right then, so Edgar Pons at the front, his lead just under a second now, so he's extended it by one-tenth. Uh, behind him it is Viege. In fact, no, Viege just closed it down to eight-tenths through sector one, so it's, uh, it's playing about the same. Odendal just behind Viege by a couple of tenths, so those two battling out, but here we are watching the battle for fifth with Granado and Luca Marini. Yep, certainly a good battle. Both of these guys recently moved from Moto3 bikes to now the bigger Moto2 bikes. This is Granado's second time on a Moto2 bike, and Granado's also been racing a fair few 600s back home in Brazil to, uh, to keep himself, you know, fit and, uh, and bike ready. Yeah, and Granado, the Brazilian, actually did get a podium uh, second race of the season in Portimao, race two there, so uh, he's no stranger to it. Uh, qualified in fourth, obviously, here, uh, and he finished fourth in race one in Portimao, so uh, he'll be hoping to uh, challenge, uh, get, well, definitely, I don't think he's going to get on the podium now with Odendal so far ahead, but he'll be hoping if he can close down on Fellini at any point, that if the Italian was to suffer some problems later on in the race, he should be able to get past him. Yep, and we have seen drama here this weekend uh, in the Moto3 race. We saw huge drama on the last lap, but right now it's all about Moto2. Pond still leads, but that gap still si sitting pretty steady at just over a second. Yeah, it's been fluctuating between 0.8 and 1.0, so that's the first time it's going to the 1.1s. Um, Fierge and Ovendahl behind him seem almost like they're settling into it now. I don't think they've got the pace to challenge Pons at the front, have they, with, uh, no, with seven the, laps to the, go? the rhythm seems to be pretty set. All of these guys, they all seem to be able to drop their lap times all together, but uh, Pons does seem to be able to just, you know, pull out one or two tenths when he needs to. And you're right, again, look, Vierge will pull ahead of Odendahl in the twisties. When they get onto those two long straights, Odendahl closes back enough to have a look into turn one, but then deciding not to make the move just a little bit too far back this time. Yep, and obviously there, as we can see on the left-hand side of the screen, Vierge, and Odendahl right together within a six second gap back to Fellini who is then four seconds ahead of Granado and Marini. Do you know what, Granado on that last lap was almost a second quicker than Fellini and there's only four seconds there and there's still six laps to go so you know what my prediction of him catching him might not have been that far wrong. Yeah you know Granado again showing, being able to drop into the 155s at, in this mid stage of the race able to you know clearly he's got that bike set up to go the distance as Odendahl comes close to the edge just can't get past him. But he's a lot closer here. If he can stay this close, coming onto that back straight, I think he'll have enough to get past him by the end of the start-finish straight, because as we've seen, his power down there, but look at this, as you say, just through those sets of turn 10 onto that back straight is so quick and just seems to have a much better power out of there. But what can Odendahl do down the straight? Let's see. It looks like he's lining something up now. You know, it looks like he's taking slightly wider lines to try and tip in a bit later and carry a bit more corner speed to get a bit, a better run onto that straight as they go in front of the wall and down into through turn 13 getting ready for the 14 15 flip and then flop to the left yep and all the while these two are battling out and Odendahl's getting closer and closer just Pons eking out more and more of a lead at the top see what I mean Odendahl definitely closer and look at him powering down the straight now that's not just slipstream that's obviously uh, tuning of that bike shall we say because they're all on similar well, got identical engines but look has he done enough on the no. brakes can't get past on the brakes maybe he's maybe he's waiting for a later lap maybe he's just testing it he did seem to pull out of the slipstream very early there so maybe he's just going to save it for a later lap to know when he can definitely get past. See if he has a look down into turn one like he has been doing, but you're right, he pulled out that slipstream very early. It looks like he's trying to get through at turn one, but again, just not close enough, able to close into him, but still just has to settle just behind. Again, as Vieja takes this different line to try and defend through turn two. 
Yeah, and the gap to Edgar Pons at the front now, 1.8 seconds. He's benefiting from these two slowing each other up. But again, we're going to see, look at them going at each other. So close through the twisty bits. And then uh, Viege will just pull away a little bit, as you say, before they get onto the, the back straight. And that seems to be a, a curse for Rundell at the moment. He needs to be close to get onto that back straight to have an advantage to, it. I think, try and take him into turn one and be his best bet. Mm, yeah, and coming back to the, the Granado gaining on Fellini battle, that last lap Granado was 0.4 of a second faster than Fellini. So there's currently a three second gap. You know, could something happen if Granado can keep up that pace? And we, we did see Fellini fade slightly in the race one towards the end. So maybe Granado can get up there into fourth, but certainly Granado has broken free of Marini. Marini in sixth, and now two seconds back on the Brazilian rider. Yeah, Marina's actually got to be careful. He's not going to come into the attention of Tesha. They're lapping at similar times, but he's only about 1.3 seconds ahead of him. So. But let's uh, keep an eye on this battle for second at the moment where Viege, as we're saying, coming through these corners, coming onto the back straight, just seems to eke out that all-important lead. Just as they come through turn 14 and 15 onto the back straight, it just means that Odendahl is four or five bike lengths back, or more, eight bike lengths back. And Ooh, even a, though... A bit of a twitch there from Odendahl as well. Yeah. That won't help his run onto the straight. But even though he then shows brilliant power down the back straight to kind of close with him, it, as you say, it's almost like he's deliberately pulling out of the slipstream to not overtake him, which I think... Oh, no, but now he has made that move stick down the back straight as they come into turn 16. So Odendahl into second place ahead of Viege. Yeah, strong showing from Odendahl. They're running it a bit wider through that corner there, it seems, than Viege. Viege opting for a bit of a tighter line as they come past our commentary position. About three or four bike lengths between the two. OK, so they're on completion of lap 10 of 15. It is Edgar Pons, who has a 2.3 second lead at the head of this field. In front of Odendahl, Viege in third. And then it's, well, Fellini Granado. Something's happened there because Fellini has now gone up to fourth. So I don't know if Granado ran off track because he had a second advantage or so, didn't he? Uh, it was Granado gaining on Fellini. So Fellini is still, still just ahead, but definitely that gap is, is coming down. You know, Granado was 0.8 or so of a second faster that lap. Apologies, I saw them swap places. My, my, my mistake there. I was getting a little bit too carried away. As you say, Granado has uh, opened that gap up the now quite nicely. And Marini keeping a consistent 1.3 before gap back to Tesha. But this battle for seventh here between Tesha, Nagashima and Ruhu is starting to hot up. Ruhu is looking for a way through on Nagashima at almost every corner. He's trying to see if he can get through on the inside. And is he lining up something here? It looks like no, just not close enough, but he's certainly having a look. And Tesha, a big look back to see what the two behind him are doing. I would be focusing ahead if I were you, Tesha, but uh, that's just me. And Nagashima very wide there, but then cuts it, brings it back tight across as they run down into turn, through turn nine and into turn 10, with Ruhu taking the inside line and slipping. Oh, oh and Ruhu, Ruhu comes off down. and his bike keeps on going, keeps on going. It's gonna go across the track, which is always dangerous, but luckily it goes across onto the barrier and everyone avoids the bike. Well, that was very dangerous. Ruhu, I was just about to say 14 year old. I think he might have just turned 15, I'm not sure, from, uh, from Rome. Brilliant performance and a great wide from him. Just lost it under power there, it's a shame. So that's at turn 10, it looks like yellow Here's flag is out. of this, just loses the front, but then the bike re-grips and it's just at the right lean angle, so that's a pretty incredible sight yes. to see a bike Thank ride. goodness there was no riders directly behind them, you know, and there was a big enough gap, because look at the exactly. person come through there, and luckily enough, the young Ruhu, who was just too big to ride, he rode in the CED Moto3 last year, it was just too big for a Moto3 bike this year, but he'll be disappointed there, gutted, because he was riding so well. And he was and he was gaining on those two much more experienced guys, so it is a bit of a disappointment for him. It looks like Odendahl has now opened up over a half second gap over Viege, so it looks like Odendahl's getting more comfortable in second but having said that Pons is now 2.3 seconds ahead so it yeah. looks like it could be a it could be a pretty pretty comfortable last four laps for Pons yeah I think he's 2.3 seconds ahead and Odin while he was probably about seven hundredths of a second quicker than the Pons on that last lap I don't think there's gonna be enough to close it down as you say with only four laps to go so with 11 laps completed Pons looked like he could be on for taking a second race win of the day uh, replicating his compatriot Juan Mir from the Moto3 uh, Junior World Championship earlier and that's Alan Tesha in seventh. Yep, just behind Luca Marini there. Marini maybe is suffering a bit from that crash in race one, as here we go, up on the back marker, on the stock six already. Nagashima just slips past. Yeah, that is, I tell you what, Tesha is definitely closing that gap to Marini. It's down to six tenths of a second. Yep, and the, uh, the good thing about being the only rider in your class is that if you are 
RBN Santana, you are guaranteed the win in your class. Is there no one else circulating? Yeah, if you can keep it up, right? Exactly. <laughs> so there we can see. Uh, let's just have a little look back at the toe screws. Edgar Podge say 2.2. So Odin Dahl is making a dent, um, but not quite a big enough one, I don't think, to uh, threaten Edgar Ponzi's race victory. Tessa there behind Marini, and that's the battle for six. Yeah, closing like ridiculously quickly, actually. It's visually. Every, every corner, he's closing a huge amount. Yep, Tesha definitely getting out there. Both of these riders may be riding a bit injured. Tesha with his big crash yesterday. Luca Marini with his big crash earlier in the day today. And I reckon Tesha's going to have something for him into turn 16. Yeah, I think you're right. Coming down the back straight, under braking. I think we could see uh, Tesha make his move on Marini. Yep, there is the Pons team again. His, his chief mechanic there in the glasses with uh, Nieto in the back there. So the gap remains, uh, what, 2.9 seconds. That was a huge, I don't know what happened to uh, Odendale there, but Pons, I think, just responded and put in a 155.7, seven tenths quicker than Odendale and Vierge behind him. So, um, yeah, Vierge behind him. I, I, I think he's just let us know that, yeah, he did have a bit in reserve, if that makes sense. Yeah, and Pons seems to be really strong in that second sector. Um, in that second sector, Odendale set a 63.3 whereas Pond set a 62.7. So, you know, 0.6 of a second as Alan Tesha slips up the inside of Luca Marini. Yeah, brilliant move there. Battle for sixth. Marini passed, uh, sorry, Tesha passed Marini on the Paginus Amarillius HB40 Junior bike. Uh, and Tesha, you'll expect to pull away here now and make sixth place uh, his own. Just yep. five seconds up the road to Granado. I don't think he's going to catch him with uh, with two and a half laps to go. Well, uh, Odendal and Viege, they seem to have sorted themselves out. Gap up to six tenths. And as you say, Edgar Pons, three seconds ahead of Odendal now. Yep, another really strong showing from these top five guys. And it's pretty clear that, you know, those top three of Pons, Odendal and Viege are almost on a different level, at least today, to, to the guys behind. You know, a huge nine-second gap from Vierge in third to Fellini in fourth. That's pretty significant. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, even there, there's another second back to Granado, although he has closed that to second. I don't know if he's, he's still taking out four tenths for Fellini. It could be interesting. Tesha, another six seconds back almost in, uh, in sixth. And then there's a, a couple of tenths back to Marini. Um, but Nagashima, three seconds back. So they're quite spread out now throughout the field. There is Marini, as you can see. Yep, and it does look like Alan Tesha has yeah, been able to push away. his advantage. Marini just looking for a solid result. Bit of a bit of leather flapping there on Marini's left arm. Looks like his gloves are unfortunately undone, but that should have no performance deficit for him. It's Probably just annoying. Just annoying yeah. yeah, it's annoying and it gives you a little bit of a... You can get a little bit of almost like a rash if it rubs against in the same place, which is really annoying, but not going to affect you during the race. So looking down the straight there, that's Fellini, isn't it? Yep, Fellini ahead of Granado. Granado is he's getting closer. It'll be interesting to see what this lap is, the difference between them. Granado set a really fast sector one there to, uh, to close in on Fellini. And as they come across the line, the gap has closed down and it is now just 1.1 seconds. With two laps to go, can Granado do it? There's no incentive. Look at that carrot being stuck out in front of him. Fellini obviously struggling. He lapped around that last lap almost one, half a second, yeah. yeah. So, you know, half a second and a one second gap. In theory, Granado will be right there on the last lap. Can he really pull something out? In, in this final stage is to get another really strong fourth position. And as you can see there, Pons maintaining that three second lead at the head of the field, ahead of Stephen Odendahl and um, Xavi Vierge, who it looks like we got the podium locked in there. Yeah, similar to race one. Yeah, more or less. You know, we saw some drama in Moto3 in the last lap, but uh, with the riders so spread out, it doesn't look like we'll see a similar sort of drama. So it looks like an almost identical repeat to the podium. Oh, well, Granada's taken oh, three tenths out of Fellini in that first sector. Sorry to interrupt there. We've only got two laps. Well, this is the penultimate lap. Three tenths in that first sector. Can he possibly catch the Italian? They're getting closer, and this is definitely going to be the battle to watch to the line. Although, having said that, happy to be proven wrong, as it looks like Vierge has massively closed up on Odendal. Our timing screen's showing a second difference, but I will bet my house that that is not a second difference on Yeah, screen. I think you're right. Odendal clearly having an issue at some point, or running wide, because, uh, wow, that's, that's, that's a huge close, because it was 1.3 last time. Maybe Odendal's tyres have just run off, or maybe he just ran right in a corner. But either way, uh, this is now going to be the battle for second. And um, obviously, we saw Odendal like, hold off here, didn't we, in race one, but I don't know if he's going to be able to do it now, because... There we go, an example of the power, though, of that AGR team. Uh, Kalex down the back straight as he manages to seemingly pull about a six or seven bike lengths on Vierge. Yeah, the Kalex frame itself has a reputation of being very stable, which, you know, classically in the World Championship, usually you saw Kalex riders with slightly higher top speed than those on the Suitors, which was a bit more of, a, of an arrow, much thinner bike, not quite as stable at those high speeds. So can Viege close that gap to make a move? We're on the last lap. This is incredibly exciting. And also, we've got the battle between Fellini 
and Granado. But that's actually increased a little bit now. It looks like uh, almost back up to a second. So I don't think we're going to have Granado on the back of Fellini as they come round. Um, but it's not long left to go now on this last lap. And Edgar Pons could be on for his second race. We will be on for his second race of the day unless a disaster would happen and strike. Yep, but the battle for second and the battle for fourth is still on, so it'll be interesting to see if Viege can somehow get past Odendal, but with Odendal being so strong in that final sector, I reckon that Odendal might just have the edge with a 0.3 of a second advantage. And so here's far. race leader Edgar Pons, to say, one race, one. He's been started on pole position for both races. Uh, hasn't got the fastest lap in this race, so he won't do too to the triumvirate because Stephen Odendal will do that, unless he can uh, sit on his last lap, I doubt it. They're lapping almost a second slower than the fastest lap. But uh, he will, by the looks of it, take race victory in race two of this Moto2 European Championship. Yep, very excited to hopefully once again get to talk to him in Park for Maine in just a bit. Just a couple of corners left for him. The bike seems to still wobbling around a fair bit, especially under braking, so clearly not all of those problems alleviated. I'll be sure to ask him about that. But uh, it has been, yet again, another dominant race. As Vier yes. gets up the inside of Odendal, it's, it's down to this straight for Odendal. Can he, can he do something? We've seen Vier really strong, turn 17, so it'll be hard for Odendal, I think. You're so right, it's that last sector before the back straight. But look at Odendal, this back slipping out of him there. Has he got the traction to respond? That was brilliant from Vier, just uh, taking advantage of where he's quicker. But look at Odendal now, coming down the straight. Is he? He looks like he's powered leaves past it, him with leaves ease. Leaves it as late as he can in the slipstream, which is good, but Vier goes for the inside. Now he's going to take a different line. Vier is going to come back tighter, I think, than Odendal. We could see him try. Will Odendal cut to the inside to try and be defensive? We cut to Edgar Pons. Wonderful wheelie for him, but coming out of the line. And it, it is like, the edge, it's yep, done it. Odendal running a bit wide onto the AstroTurf there a bit, but both riders stay upright. So the urge does secure a second spot. A stunning result from him. Odendal a bit disappointed with third, but still on the podium once again. Fellini across the line in fourth, just and Canado in fifth. And Cito Pons there, big thumbs up from the boss and from your dad. A wonderful day overall for Edgar Pons. Alan Tesha crosses in sixth, a Frenchman. Head of Luca Marini, Ponzi's teammate in seventh, and we should have Nagashima coming across the line next. Yep, we great do. Great result from the Japanese rider, yep. just ahead of Medina, who comes across the line just now. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's great being on the start finish line. Theo Bertan. Just beats uh, Xavi Cardellis, sorry, Ricky Dallas, to a, a tenth position. And we should have Marco Nekfazil crossing 11th. But there we go, Edgar Pons, race winner. Didn't look in trouble. Well, interesting to see what he says in Park Fermi this time. He wasn't happy after he won by a similar margin in race one. Uh, more riders crossing the line now. Miguel Pons in 13th. Pitet in 14th. Scheib in 15th, taking the last points and the line 16th. Nicky Coates uh, finishing in 17th. Sigvartsen 18th. Morales 19th. Buckner 20th. And we should have Stefan Fossard coming across the line very shortly as we just have to take 21st. But there we go. Edgar Pons, confirmation of his victory. And another brilliant performance uh Stephen Fassad has crossed the line there go Brenner for 22nd Gonzalez taking the uh super stock victory if he comes across which he should do if he can keep it up right through the funeral final set of corners and Pons celebrating to the fans look victory and the Spanish fans will be so happy here uh, they've been the Spanish victor in every race so far well all the races we've got for you today because we've had five um, but a brilliant and dramatic end with Viege and Odendal again and there is Gonzalez across the line to uh, to take 23rd place. It's Santana who will need apologies to uh, to take the super stock victory, uh, and he's done that. He's just got confirmation through Sugel, Ramey in 24th, Sugel in 25th. Santana will finish in 26th, uh, and it's Ruhu, Rosley, Gradinger, and Turner who unfortunately uh, all failed to finish. So Stephen Odendahl fastest lap 154.809 on lap four. Unfortunately, meant he couldn't hold off the edge at the end there to take his second second place of the day. But two podiums, great bit of work for the South African and Viege again improving from third in race one to take second in race two. But it is all about that man, Edgar Pons, another dominant victory, extending his lead at the top of the championship. We'll get the updated championship standings after the podium. But uh, Stephen Ondal should be very, very happy with the performance today. Brilliant race one. Great race long battle with Javi Viege again. Uh, it's been brilliant watching those two, uh, those two ride today. They really have been going at it hammer and tongs. And uh, well, it's kind of fitting, I suppose, that one finished second in race one and one finished second in, uh, in race two. Two. So there is Edgar Pons already down to park for me. No messing around with him. No big celebratory lap. He's down there celebrating with his team. Already giving them feedback 
And now he's run down to Park Fermi to have a word with the Spaniard to get some more information from him. Just find out whether he'd sort out the problems uh, from race one. Because believe it or not, as we say, he ran by a single margin in race one. And he didn't seem very happy. And there we go. Xavi Viege taking second place in Park Fermi. So let's get confirmation of the final results. Edgar Pons, there we go. Second race win of the day. Uh, ahead of Xavi Viege, 4.4 seconds his margin of victory. Stephen Odendahl, another half a second back in third. Federico Fellini in fourth. Good race for Eric Granado in fifth. Tesha six. Luca Marini seventh, Tatsuta Nagashima on the CSR in eight, sorry on the Calix in eighth, and ninth is Alejandro Medina on the Aria. That's why I was getting confused. Tech three bike as well. We had in the top ten there. Uh, Theo Balbertin on the Suta in tenth, Javi Cardellas eleventh, Marco Necfasil twelfth, Miguel Pons thirteenth. Good point scoring finish for him. Adrian Petit fourteenth, Max Scheib finishes uh, in the last point scoring position fifteenth. Enderline sixteenth, Nicky Coates I believe is seventeenth in race one as well on the Ariane. Uh, so well on to the Briton there and Thomas Sigvartsen the Norwegian in eighteenth. Uh, Harry, I believe, is just getting hold of Edgar Pons in Park Fermi, so we'll be going down very shortly to have a chat with him to find out what the Spaniard thought of his dramatic day. Well, I say dramatic, it was more dominant, wasn't it? You know, two victories by over four seconds. I think race one, it was actually three and a half in the end, but he'd led for about four seconds uh, throughout the most of the race. So uh, let's head down to Park Fermi. I think Parry has uh, managed to grab hold of Axel Pons and uh, have a chat with him. Improvements race two. Yeah, in race two, bike was working better. I had, I had much feeling in the front. No, at the beginning, it was it was a bit hard to get used. No, with this heat, because during all the weekend we didn't test in in this in this hour. No, so it was a bit hard. But but yeah, we managed to to push hard again and open a gap with the with the other riders. So I'm very happy. How has gone all the all the weekend, and I'm really proud of the job of the team. Sí, la carrera ha sido, ha sido complicada. Nunca habíamos rodado en, este, en esta hora, así que no sabíamos cómo iban a reaccionar los neumáticos, pero la verdad es que muy bien. He conseguido hacer otra vez un buen ritmo, escaparme de, de los otros pilotos, que esto es lo importante. Y la verdad es que muy contento de acabar así el fin de semana con dos victorias, ampliando la, la, la ventaja sobre el segundo clasificado en el campeonato. Y la verdad es que muy contento de cómo hemos trabajado el equipo, yo. La verdad es que muy, muy contento y muy satisfecho. Edgar Pons then, rather happy, looks like his team obviously sorted out the problems that we were saying so from race one and uh, comfortable double race victory. Let's have a little look back at the action though from race two in the Moto2 European Championship. It was Edgar Pons on the front row starting ahead of Javier and Stephen Odendahl from the second row would make another great start as we're about to see down into turn one. Full gas is the signal we give there. Federico Fellini, let's have a look at the start though. Well, Pons. He hasn't been led, actually, I think, in the last three races at all. He's led across the line, start to finish. He led into turn one. Brilliant start from him. Viege on Odendahl into second. Um, and that would be the race long battle with see Fellini at this point. Looked like he was going to keep with the podium, guys, and maybe challenge for uh, third place, but unfortunately didn't have the pace throughout the race. Look at Pons having some troubles there early on. And that's Odendahl sneaking ahead of Viege. As we mentioned in race one, Odendahl managed to keep that and maintain that advantage, but uh, just didn't have it. I think Viege just using his bit of savvy and a bit of tactical new in race two to uh, get the better of the South Africa. But those two did have a great duel. Uh, all the while, obviously, these guys battling out left Edgar Pons at the front to, uh, to break away. And, uh, you know, Pons and just setting the most consistent lap times, keeping around the low 155s until later on in the race when the tyres started to go off. And Viege and Odendahl, as you can see there, were just battling all race long. Uh, and what I think the biggest problem is, you see this, is exactly that. Odendahl had the power on the straight to go past Viege on the target bank bike, but come through turns kind of 10 to 13, and that unfortunately excuse me, was uh, Gabriel Ruhu, Fellini's teammate on the Team Chatty bike. Thank goodness that bike not riding into anyone as it went back across the track, uh, because that could have been disastrous but luckily uh, no one hurt there and Odendahl and Viege this looks like it's coming up to the last corner battle and it was spectacular I've got Harry just joining me back from Park Ferme uh, it was a case we say Viege quicker through those last section of corners Odendahl seemed to have the advantage on the straight so Odendahl had to Viege had to try and work out a, a way to get an advantage in the final turn 16-17 he did and a brilliant podium for him yeah Viege just able to come in ahead of Odendahl Viege really happy with that podium in Park Ferme clearly overjoyed Odendahl looked a bit disappointed as we get ready for the podium yeah, and Egg Pons, as we see there, another Spanish flag to take top spot on the podium for the fifth time today. And the South African flag of Odendahl joining them. These guys, obviously, all over the age of 18, so they're allowed to have some, uh, some fizzy champagne, we like. Yes, certainly. And a big team effort by Pons and his Pons Racing team. 
as we as we say we also have the stock 600 winner there on the podium as well along with the moto 3 guys that is avian santana on the yamaha r6 once again claiming victory in the stock 600 class yeah frick our team rider on the team yamaha the only super stock 600 rider at this round and uh, he would have benefited by 50 points which will put him way ahead at the uh, top of the championship he was already four points ahead so he'll now have 104 points uh, ramirez is second place and 50 will maybe be at the next round yep and there is the team getting the teams constructor trophy good result from them double win for them unfortunate for luca marini not to be able to repeat his barcelona podium yeah and he crashed at race one but managed to stay on even though his baton and bruise to take uh, seventh in race two and as you see there that is santana getting his prize as the top super stock 600 yep and now the trophy to ondal for third unfortunately able to not repeat his second position from the first race but uh, a brace of podiums for Odendal today so a strong result from the South African yeah, either didn't, didn't look too happy did he there but like, I think you should take heart from that second and third place a great result and there's Viege Yep, yeah, strong yeah. result from Vierge, but Edgar Pons is still able to extend his lead in the championship. And, you know, as we were saying at the start, with over half the championship now over, this is really make it or break it time for Vierge and for Edgar Pons. There we go, Pons getting his second winner's trophy of the day. Clearly oh. overjoyed with that. Now it's going to be time to bring out the oversized check for the fuel. He's got a lot of fuel, free fuel this year. I think Edgar Pons, he should be uh, inviting his friends around to fill up. <laughs> no, maybe invite it to the other riders. But uh, no, congratulations to him. So we're going to get ready for the Spanish National Anthem for the fifth time today. A very triumphant day for the Spaniards here at Motorland Aragon. Yep, a beautiful day for sure. There we go, Spanish National Anthem for the fifth time today. Edgar Pons uh, completing the double then in the Moto2 race. We started from pole, and these guys will spray Carver and Champagne yep. over each other. Wasting no time to get the Carver spraying. Clearly overjoyed, and now that they don't have another race, they can really enjoy that Carver. Now we can see what that's going to mean for the championship standings very shortly, but just a brilliant day's racing, Harry, here, isn't it? We have two Moto3 races, one Superbike European Championship race, and two Moto2 European Championship races, and we've seen a lot of drama, and the Moto3 race coming right down to uh, the last lap in race two red flag in race one yeah i mean you know the, the winners in each class kind of broke away and were pretty much unmatchable but the the battles throughout the field especially for those final two podium spots really produced some great racing and you know that's the best thing is that sure the battle for the win might not have been entertaining but there was entertainment all throughout it wasn't just you know two second gaps between everyone and here we have the championship results overall edgar pons obviously leading 120 points 39 points ahead of Xavier Vierge. That's brilliant. Xavier Vierge there. Stephen Odendahl in third. Eric Granado in fourth. The Brazilian, two great races for him today. Alan Tesha riding through the pain after a crash, you saying qualifying yesterday. Luca Marini in sixth upon his teammate there. Yep, and Tetsuta Nagashima in seventh. Some strong results from him as he continues to finish inside the top ten ahead of Medina and Fellini. Fellini unfortunately dropping back. Thiab Alberto and the French uh, rider there in tenth ahead of Gabriel who unfortunately crashed out a race two after Fellini's teammate there. Team Chiatti looking like he's going to have a good race. Shaib in 12th, Xavi Cardellas, uh, Marco Neckfuss in 14th, and Miguel Pons in 15th. Yep, then Dimas Aki, who, as we said, not here this weekend, ahead of Adrian Pettit and Diego Perez. All of them ahead of Ramdan Rosley. I'm a bit surprised Ramdan Rosley's that far down the order. He did have a wild card in the World Championship earlier this season, so that is a bit surprising to me, but he's still a tied with Nicky Coates on seven points. Two 17th place finishes for Nicky Coates today. Thomas Gradigan in 21st, Brenner 22nd, and Frossard, Buckner, and Sanchez complete your championship table. So, yes, Harry, been a brilliant, exciting amount of racing here from the FIM CV reps all round four. Up next for us, believe it or not, is Albacete, where we will see one Moto3 Junior World Championship race, one Moto2 European Championship race, but two Superbike European Championship uh, races, and that will take place on the 6th of of September. Yep, I'm certainly looking forward to Moto3 there. Now just six points to separate that championship. And it'll be interesting to see in both Superbike and Moto2 if the leaders of those respective series can continue to push their advantage and try and stop the championship with a couple of races spare. Well, at your moment, you're right. Carmelo Morales leading the Superbike Championship. Moto2 is Edgar Pons and Juan Mir reducing Aaron Canet's gap in the championships significantly this, uh, this weekend uh, in the Moto3 Junior World Championship. And it 
should be some brilliant racing in Albacete. Just to recap the other rounds as well. And the 4th of October, we'll head to Navarra for one Junior Moto3 World Championship race, two Moto2 European Superbike races. Uh, sorry, European Championship races, and two Superbike European Championship races as well. Then it's off to Jerez for the 1st of November for two Moto3 races, one Moto2 and two Superbike races. And finally, the 15th of November, we're off to Valencia for the final round, two Moto3 races, two Moto2 races, and one Superbike race. And now some fans take to the track for what is a uh, sort of a track day. Yeah, they believe it or not, they let them head out onto the track uh, at the end of the day to put a few laps in, which I think is a brilliant touch. So, well, that's pretty much it from us now here. We will be back, as I say, 6th of September. So a bit of a break, Harry. These riders go away, you get to relax, kind of like the summer break they have in MotoGP, um, and uh, kind of reassess and, and rebuild themselves. Yep, ready to do it all again for the second half of the season. Right, that's it from us then. So thank you very much, and we'll see you on the 6th of September in Albacete. Bye.